wife and you're saying, I am looking forward to the summer. She's a school teacher, so she's really looking forward to this time of rest and renewal. I am hopeful. I am content. I am looking forward to what's coming. There might be some good answers. And that's great. We praise God for those seasons of goodness and celebration. But I'd also venture to say some of us might write down sentences that aren't so positive. Maybe you had to take one sentence, condense everything in your life down to one sentence, beginning with the words, I am. Maybe you would say, I am losing hope. Maybe you'd be honest. You'd say, I am really struggling. Maybe you'd say, I am not good enough. I am worn out. I am discouraged, distressed. I'm not going anywhere. I am lost. I am at the end of my road. What would you write down? How would you condense everything in your life down to one sentence, beginning with the words, I am? What would you say? I would refer to whatever you would write on that piece of paper as your personal I am statement, your personal I am. And I want to tell you this morning that whatever you write down on that piece of paper, whether positive or negative, whatever your I am is this morning could very well be one of the most substantial roadblocks in your life today. Sometimes your I am is like a cloud that hovers over all that you do. Sometimes your I am is like a pair of glasses through which you see the world. Everything is colored and everything is shaded by the the lens of your I am. When new opportunities come along and new invites to do something and open doors and next steps, I believe that your I am is always right there beside you. Sometimes your I am can be a huge roadblock, the thing that is holding you back. Here's how our I am is get us into trouble, trouble. Whether your I am is good or whether your I am is bad, here's how it gets us in trouble. Whatever your I am is, tends to be your biggest excuse. It tends to be your biggest excuse. Hey, would you be willing to volunteer in this way? No, sorry, I am whatever. Hey, would you uh, be able to go and minister to that coworker? Hey, I would, but I am blank. God says, hey, I want you to go and talk to that barista at Starbucks and encourage her today. Sorry, God, but I am whatever. Approach that person who is crying and ask them what's wrong. Hey, I'm sorry, I am. Go to that person who is sick and visit with them. Sorry, but I am whatever. Sometimes our I am can become our biggest excuse. And you know what? Our biggest excuse can so often become our biggest obstacle. A big obstacle that holds us back from what God wants us to do. God wants to call us on to the next big thing, but so often... Our I am hold us back. They become our excuses. And they become our biggest obstacles. To put it simply, I would say this. Whatever your greatest I am is, it's your greatest excuse. And your greatest excuse becomes quickly your greatest obstacle. Your greatest I am is your greatest excuse. Your greatest excuse is your greatest obstacle. I hope I've been able to show you just how dangerous and detrimental our I am's can become. And so this morning, I want to begin a new series throughout the coming weeks entitled I Am. And we're going to be talking about all the many I am's that consume us and hold us back and become our greatest excuses. And hopefully by the end of today's message and the end of this series, we will view all of our I am's, all of our biggest excuses and obstacles will view all of these things that are holding us back from where God is wanting to call us. And we'll look at them in light of who God is. And I'll think that what we'll see is that our I am's maybe aren't as big of obstacles as we would like. And in fact, I would go so far as to say these I am's don't even have to hold us back at all. These I am's don't have to be clouds over our lives and glasses that blur our vision, but instead we can push through our I am's and venture into the call that God has laid in our lives. They don't have to become obstacles. And so this morning and throughout this series, we're going to be in the story of Moses, as you can probably tell from the sermon traffic and from your bulletins. We're going to be in the story of Moses, which means that we are in the book of Exodus. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 3. Moses was a guy with a lofty calling. God called him to something pretty big. 
And Moses, if you've ever read his story of his calling, he had a lot of excuses. But Moses had a lot of I am. Moses had a lot of obstacles that seemed to be in front of him, and he laid them all out before God and tried to show God, see God, look, I can't do what you're calling me to do. But what we read about in his story is that God wasn't concerned at all. But instead, God began to show Moses that in light of all that God is, Moses can finally make the leap to follow in God's will. So we're going to be in Exodus 3 this morning, and I'm going to catch us up just before we begin to read scripture, kind of where we are. If you know the story of Exodus, Exodus kind of drops us in right after the story of Joseph and Genesis. And it's in, it's in uh, this story that Joseph's faithfulness and all of the Israelites, because of Joseph's faithfulness, all of the Israelites came and lived in Egypt, right? And they prospered in Egypt, and they grew, and they became fruitful, and the population grew. But then the book of Exodus begins with these troubling words. Verse 8, it says, Then a new king, uh, then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. That's how Exodus began. Then a king whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. And this new king, he looks out all across his kingdom and he sees all of the Israelites growing and multiplying. And this new king says, hey, I'm getting kind of worried. All these Israelites are growing and they're prospering and they're numerous. And I'm worried that if war breaks out, these Israelites will be mightier than us. What, what happened? Well, the king was worried. He was fearful. And so we see that the root of all injustice is always fear. And so the Pharaoh comes up with a plan. And he puts slave masters over them and he makes them slaves. But the Israelites continued to multiply. It didn't solve the problem. And so then Pharaoh moves on to plan B. He goes to the midwives who were responsible with delivering the Israelites. And he tells them, hey, if it's a girl, you can keep the baby. But if it's a boy, I want you to put the baby to death. And so what we essentially read here is that Pharaoh is advocating for genocide. Within just a few generations, the Israelites would have been extinguished. But the midwives were crafty, and they feared God, and they didn't do what Pharaoh said. And so finally, Pharaoh moves on to plan C, a nationwide command. Any baby boys that are found should be thrown into the Nile. The narrative of Exodus takes us to a family of Israelites who are directly affected by this command. The mother just had a baby boy, and fearing that he might be killed, she puts him in a basket, covers it in pitch and tar, and places this basket among the Nile in the Nile River. Eventually, Pharaoh's own daughter comes out to bathe, and she found the baby among the reeds and took pity on the baby. And here we see that the root of injustice may be fear, but the root of justice is always compassion. And Pharaoh's daughter had compassion upon the baby. She adopts the baby into the royal family, names him Moses, and Moses grows up in Pharaoh's household. One day he's walking amongst his people, the Israelites, and he sees an Egyptian beating an Israelite slave. In an act of premeditated murder, Moses kills the Egyptian and buries his body in the sand. The next day, Moses thought he had gotten away with the murder until two Israelites were fighting. Moses tries to break up the fight, and they say, oh, are you going to kill us just like you did the Egyptian? Moses quickly realizes that he's in danger, that his dark secret was revealed, and so he runs away into the land of Midian. Eventually, in Midian, Moses kind of rebuilds his life. He finds a spouse, and he's no longer the prince of uh, prince in the house of Pharaoh, but now he's just a lowly shepherd. And one day he takes his sheep out to graze in the wilderness, and that day his life was forever changed because he encounters the God of his ancestors. That was a long buildup. Are you with me? Did everybody follow me through all that? All right. Let's begin Exodus chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Let's see what happens to Moses. Here's what happens. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. The priest of Midian. And he fled the fled, he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw through the that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. 
So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Now, I don't know about you, but right off of that, I'm just going to tell you, I am surprised by Moses' response to God in this passage. Here Moses is, he's wandering in the wilderness, and he stumbles upon a burning bush that is on fire, but it's not turning to ash, it's not crumbling apart. And Moses is curious about it, he's kind of mystified by it, and so he walks a bit closer, and out of this bush comes a booming voice that says Moses' name. Now I don't know about you, but just put yourself in Moses' shoes for one second. If that happened to me, I can tell you for 100% certainty, my response would not be, here I am. I don't know about you, but that would not be my first response. My first response would probably be to turn tail and run in the opposite direction. But I think that Moses' response here is so curious because he simply says it without any fear. Here I am. Seems as if Moses isn't concerned with this talking bush. He doesn't seem to be afraid. He doesn't even seem to be surprised. It's as if this talking bush is kind of just par for the course for Moses. That is, until verse 5. Look what it says. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then look what Moses does. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. You see the difference? What changed? What changed? Here, here Moses goes from, here I am, Lord, to all of a sudden hiding his face and being afraid to even look at God. What changed? Here's what changed. Moses, he found out who was calling from the bush. God reveals himself. He says, hey, Moses, it's me. You know who I am. I'm the God of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob. And Moses realizes that it's the God of his ancestors calling to him from the bush. So why is he afraid? Well, I think that here we get one of Moses' first I am. So maybe it's an I am that you would write down yourself. If I was to pass out that piece of paper. Here's what Moses says. Moses says, I am unworthy. <clears throat> Moses looked at what he'd done. He looked at his past. He looked at all of his sin. He saw the blood on his hands from killing the Egyptian. And in light of all of who God was, in light of the burning bush, Moses said, I am unworthy. I am unworthy. He's so afraid to be so close to the Lord of the universe. He's afraid because he looks at his past and see all, sees all that he's done. And I feel like in some ways Moses was probably afraid that God was visiting him, not to call him, but to kill him. I think Moses was afraid that it was judgment day. He thought God was ready to strike him down and bury him in the sand, just like he did to that Egyptian I'm almost certain that Moses, after hearing great names like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Moses probably felt pretty low. He probably felt unworthy to be even in the same category as those guys. And so maybe if you had to name your I am statement this morning, maybe you too would write down on that piece of paper. If I had to condense everything that I'm feeling in this moment down to the words I am, it would be I am unworthy. Maybe you're here this morning to say, man, if I heard God call my name out, I would think it was judgment day, too. I prepare to be struck down. I have to be afraid that if God was calling out my name, he wouldn't have anything nice to say. Maybe in light of your past and your sin, you can't God see God calling your name out for any other reason than punishment and anger and judgment. But here's the truth. Here's the truth this morning. First of all, just like Moses, if you, if you feel like God is calling your name this morning, I want to tell you it's not because he wants to punish you. Can I tell you that this morning? If you, hear God's, if you hear God calling out your name, it's not because he wants to cast judgment on you. But now God calls out people's names because he wants to save us. If you hear God calling out your name, it's because he wants to redeem you. He wants to call you to something 
grace. Here's why. Because of Christ Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus declared victory over sin and victory over death. And you know what that means? It means that you no longer have to feel unworthy. You don't have to feel that anymore. More. You know why? Because everything that makes you unworthy, all your past, all your sin, all your shame, everything that makes you unworthy is found worthy in Christ. Everything that makes you unworthy is found worthy in Jesus. Because of what Jesus did, it is found worthy. Because of what Jesus did, you can stand in front of the burning bush with your shoes on. You can get close to God without being consumed. Why? Because when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your shame. God doesn't see your unworthiness. But when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. That's who he sees. When God looks at you, he sees his perfect son. That's what Christ did for you. He makes all of us unworthy folks worthy in the sight of God. That means there's no longer a reason to hide your face in shame and in fear, but instead you can approach the throne of God freely and accept the grace that he wants to offer you. And so I want to tell you, if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, today's the day. You don't have to feel unworthy anymore. I know in a sanctuary full of church folks, you probably feel out of place. Maybe you're afraid to hear the voice of God because you're afraid of just what God might say. I can tell you what he's saying. He's saying, hey, I love you. He's saying, listen, I died for you. He's saying, I saved you. And he's saying, in my eyes, because of Jesus, you are absolutely worthy. If you're here this morning and you feel like, man, I am unworthy to be called by God, I want to remind you, because of Christ Jesus, you were made worthy. And God is calling you to something big. That was Moses' first I am. I want to move on to the second. Read with me in verse 7. It says this. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land overflowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So here, the God of the universe comes to Moses, this guy who felt unworthy and fearful. God comes to this murderer and exile, and he says, listen, Moses, I have heard the cry of your people. I have heard the cry of the Israelites in Egypt. I have seen their misery. I have seen their suffering. Aren't you glad we serve a God who is not aloof to the suffering of the world? Aren't you glad about that? We serve a God who hears the cry of his people. He sees the misery of his beloved. And God says, so, because I've seen it, because I've heard it, I am coming down. God says, listen, it's about to get real. I'm moving. I'm going to do a full court press. I'm going to show up in a big way. And so I've come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians. And I can just see Moses getting really pumped about this, right? He's probably getting really excited. He probably says, man, thank goodness. I've been waiting for someone to do something about this. This is what I've always wanted, God, was for my people to be released from their slavery. That's why I got so angry when that Egyptian was beating that Israelite all those many days ago. I want something to be done, God. Would you release them? So he's probably excited to see God's finally on the move. That's great. But then God says, this to Moses. He says, I'm about to come down. I've heard the injustice and the suffering and all that's going on in Egypt, and I'm coming down to do something about it. So now you go. That's the catch. He looks at Moses. He says, I'm coming down. I'm about to do something big. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. I can just see Moses getting speechless. You said you were coming down. I thought you were going to clean this mess up. I thought you were going to do something big, God. What do you need me for? 
And God says, yes, I'm coming down and I'm acting, but I'm going to do it through you. I love those three words. I feel like we need to put those up somewhere. Put them in your phone, put them in your car, put them on your bathroom mirror. So now go. I see the suffering. I see that's all I'm going on. I see the hurt. So now go. And I love how God puts Moses on a timetable. He doesn't just say so go. He says so now go. And he puts Moses on the clock. He wants Moses to go and he says I want you to go right now. No more waiting, no more standing around. Go right now. And I think Moses says, so now go for a reason. Because here's the problem. Another big I am, the one big I am that holds us back so often, that sets up obstacles in our way and excuses that, we, that keep us where we are in our life. One of the biggest I am's that so many of us have. God says, listen, I want you to go. I want you to do something big. I've heard the suffering. I see it. I want you to go. So often our first I am is, I am not ready. I am not ready. What well, happens so often, we pray. We say, God, act in this situation. God, would you do something big here? Would you heal this part of my life? Would you touch these people? Would you do something big in this circumstance? And we pray, and we pray, and we pray. We say, God, would you just act? Do something. I don't want to say, when you pray prayers like that, you shouldn't be surprised if in response you hear God say, so now go. You shouldn't be surprised if God comes down and he sends you. The problem is, is when God comes to us and says, so now go, I want to use you to work in these situations. Many times our first response is, I am not ready. And sorry, God, the timing is just not right. And so we sit on our calling. You ever sat on a calling before? Not a fun place to sit. You ever sat on a calling before? We say, God, I'm just not ready. I will, God. I'll go where you're calling me to go. Just not yet. I'll go, God, but I'm just trying to figure a few things out. Once I get my life in order, then I'll go. God, I'll go. I'm just a little busy. I'm a little tired. I'm a little stressed out. But once I kind of get past the season, then I'll go. When life becomes normal, I'll go. Time is just not right. I want to tell you this morning, if you've been called to do something and you're waiting on the right time, the right time will never come. Can I tell you that this morning? The right time will never come. If you're sitting on the call of God until the time is right, if God's calling and you're saying, not yet, you'll never go. It'll never happen. Because if you're waiting on life to become normal, life will never be normal. Did you know that? Life will never be normal like you want it because life is never, ever, ever normal. Have you noticed that? My family has a saying. Maybe your family has a saying too. I say it quite often. I'm sure my wife loves it. But it's a saying that my family has always given up in times where we can just tell life is just going crazy right now. I want to share it with you. And if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write it down. Maybe use this in your current vernacular. It's a great saying. I love it. And it's three words, but you say it like one word. Okay? It's all one word. And so here it is. It's always something. You ever heard of that? There it is on the board. It's always something. You heard of this saying? I say it a lot. Here's how it works. I'll teach you the proper usage of it's always something. You wake up in the morning. And your alarm didn't go off, and you're already late for work. So you get up out of bed, and you say, man, it's always something. You know, have you, ever, you know what I'm talking about? All right, I'm going to test you. Are you ready? I'll test you. So you jump out of bed, and you start to get dressed. You get in the shower, or sorry, you get out of bed, you get in the shower, and you're already out of shampoo. What do you say? It's always something. It's always something. You, get out, you get out of the shower, you start to get dressed, and you... You realize late into the day that you put two different socks on. What do you say? It's always something. The baby's running a fever. What do you say? You spilled your coffee? Traffic? It's always something. You forgot about that meeting. Well, it's always something. You get that unexpected phone call? It's always something. You get bad news? It's always something. When you lose your job, it's always something. Pop a tire, forget the, forget the paint of light bill. Well, it's always something. And here's why that saying became a saying in our house. 
It's kind of a reminder to us that, you know what, no matter what point you are in life, sometimes stinky things just happen. No matter where you're at in life, unfortunately, things happen and they happen a lot. And so we always just say it's always something. It's a reminder that there's never a normal day. There's never a normal time in our life. There's never a normal season where nothing goes wrong. Why? Because it's always something. And so if you're putting off the call of God until a normal day or a normal season or, or until things don't uh, look so hectic, I want to remind you it's always something. Something's always going to be happening. Something's always going to be going wrong. So I want to remind you, if God's calling you to do something, if he's saying, so now go, you should go. And you should go right now. There's no need to wait. Stop saying, I am not ready. And just go and fulfill the call that God has laid on your life. Because it's always something. Not only do our, 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 our common I am's, our I am unworthy, our I am not ready. But so often, we see what Moses says in this next portion. Moving on. Look at verse 10. It says this. God says, so now go. And then verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And so now we see Moses' response to this great calling of God. Go now and release the Israelites from captivity. And Moses responds, who am I? Who am I? In other words, Moses says, listen, I am the wrong person. Who am I? I'm the wrong person for this job, who am I that I should go and stand in the throne room of Pharaoh to release the Israelites? God, that's just not me. I'm not the right person. You know who you need, God? You need a politician. That's who you need. You need like an ambassador. You need to send one of them in. Someone who can go in and negotiate with Pharaoh and cut a deal and make things happen. That's what you need, God. You need someone like that. Or maybe you're looking for a more direct approach, God. Maybe you need like an army general. Maybe you need a fighter, a commander, someone who can build up an army and invade Egypt to get the Israelites out. Why don't you look for someone like that? You have the wrong guy. I'm the wrong person. Who am I? And that's as far as we'll go into the story this week. But I want to conclude by listening to God's response. Because this is how God responds. Moses says, listen, I'm the wrong person. Who am I? Find someone else. Then God says this. Verse 12. And God said, I will be with you. God says, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that I, it is I who have sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you'll worship God on this mountain. Right, right. Moses says, who am I? I am not the right person. And God responds by saying, with my presence, you are everything I need you to be. Here's what I've come to realize. When it comes to our calling, we're really, really quick to pass the buck. God calls us to something. He opens us a door to serve in a certain way. God says, so now go, I'm sending you. And so often our first response is just like Moses. We say, no, no, no. You need someone better suited for that type of work. Here's what I want to tell you. If you're being called by God somewhere, it means that God went looking for the exact right person for the job and he landed on you. It means that nobody else could do it better because God doesn't make mistakes. And you know what? God's probably saying, you know what? You're probably right. You don't have what it takes. But you know what you do have? My spirit. You might not have what it takes to fulfill this calling, but you do have my spirit. You have everything I want to give you. Here's the fact of the matter. God wants to bring his kingdom here and now, and he wants to use you. God wants to fight the injustice in this world, and he wants to use you. God wants to help the widow and the orphan, the people get stepped on in life, and he wants to use you. And so like Moses, we can point to other people that are better suited. We can say, well, help. Well, hey, well, just like let the, let the pastor do it. Let the pastor do it. He's better suited for this. We can say, hey, well, just let the politicians do it. They make society better. Let the armies do it. They're the ones who can fight injustice. And just like Moses, we can say, hey, God, maybe an ambassador or a commander is better suited 
for this type of work. I want to tell you what God told Moses. God did not say, I'm sending a politician. God did not say, I'm sending armies. God says, I am sending you. God said, I'm bringing my kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. I'm fighting the injustice of our day, and I am sending you. So now, go. I want to be clear. No president or presidential candidate can bring God's kingdom to earth. Can I tell us that this morning? Don't put your faith there, because it ain't going to happen. No president or presidential candidate can bring God's kingdom to earth. No army is strong enough to put a lid on evil and injustice to allow God's kingdom to thrive. No set of laws are good enough to alone help those who get stepped on in this life. We have to stop pointing at other people and other things and putting our hope in other places. Stop waiting on other people to change things. Why? Because God says, I'm bringing my kingdom to earth. And I want to do it through you. God's calling us. God's justice is being issued into the darkest of places. Lives are being changed. Souls are being touched by God. But he wants to use us. Here's the good news. That may seem like a pretty lofty calling. The good news is this. We don't have to do it alone. Yeah, if God's calling you, it means that he searched the entire world for the right person for the job and he landed on you. And he knows you don't have what it takes, but the good news is you do have his spirit. And here's the crazy thing about the spirit of God. Today's Pentecost, you've been talking a lot about the spirit of God. I'm going to talk about one more thing. Here's the great thing about the spirit of God. The more that you rely on the spirit of God, the more that you hunger for it. Day after day after day, the more that you rely on the Spirit of God, the more that you hunger for the Spirit of God. I'll show you what I mean. If you fast forward in the story of Moses, long after he released the Israelites, they escape into the wilderness. God calls them. He says, hey, I have this land that I promised you. I want you, Moses, I want you to lead these people to the promised land. Moses, once again, starts throwing God excuses. But finally, he says this. He says this. He says, listen, God, I'll go. But if your presence does not go with me, don't even send me. This is the same guy. This is the same guy talking. This is Moses. He says, if your presence doesn't go with me, don't even send me. God, if you're not going with us, we ain't going. You can call us to the promised land, but God, I need your help to lead these people. I need your presence with me. Moses says, God, I crave your spirit. I need your help. You see the lesson that Moses relied on at the beginning of the story is that he needs the God's presence to fulfill his call. And I believe that the more that God relied on the presence of God time and time and time again, the more that he hungered for it for the next stretch of the journey. Moses realized just how much he needed God's presence to see him through each and every day. And the same thing is true of us. You may feel like you are the wrong person. You might feel like you're being called to something above your pay grade. You might feel like God's calling you to something that you'll never see yourself doing. I want to tell you this morning, you may not have what it takes, but you do have his Holy Spirit. And the more that you rely on God's Spirit time and time and time again, the more you'll begin to hunger for it to the point where you won't even step out the door Unless you know that God and his spirit are going with you. There's a little bit more. Because here's what happens. The more that we hunger for the spirit, the more that we rely on the spirit, the more that we crave the spirit, the more of the spirit we receive. The more we rely on the Holy Spirit, the more that we hunger for it is the more that we'll receive. So if you, get, if you rely on it time and time again, you get a craving for the Holy Spirit, the more of God's spirit he can thrust upon you and fill you up with till like we sung about today will become overflowing with the spirit of God so do you hunger for it do you rely on it because then God can really give you all that he wants to give you because the more you rely on it the more you'll receive it happened again just this morning just like it happens most days some weeks are better than others just like a few weeks ago it got really bad 
Rosie was sick for a few days. She had a fever that lasted like three days. And if you have a kid that gets sick, especially when they're an infant, you know that it's great, great. You're getting permission to baby them for like three whole days, right? You get some great cuddles in, you know? You get some, uh, you get some great time with them where they get really, really clingy. And so you kind of get permission to baby them a little bit more when they're sick. And this happened just a few weeks ago. Rosie wasn't feeling very good. And so we cut a lot. Andy and I even let her sleep in our bed because she wasn't sleeping very well and she wouldn't go to sleep in her own. And so we said, hey, we'll make an exception because you're sick. You know how that gets you in trouble sometimes? We'll make an exception because you're sick. She didn't want to spend any time on her own, so it was like every single hour she was attached to one of our hips, to the point where we couldn't even set her down. We had to hold her all the time. Well, we said, okay, she's sick. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, make an exception. We'll hold on to her. We'll baby her this week. After she finally got over her sickness, her fever broke, everything kind of went back to normal, but she still wanted to be babied. Anybody ever been there? She still wanted to be babied. We were happy to oblige, though. Where we, 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 we were trying to cut her off. We didn't want her to sleep with us anymore, but we continued to still hold her and cuddle her and coddle her. And even now, even this morning, sometimes she just doesn't want to be without one of us, right? And she usually does this. This is what she does. Is there a picture? Yeah, that's what she does. Do you know what this means? This means pick me up. I want you, right? It's very, very hard to pass this up, right? Now, here's what I've learned. The more that Rosie, when Rosie was sick, the more that she wanted us, right? She's sick. She doesn't feel good. I want you, right? So we had to hold her all the time. But the more that she, the more that she relied on us, what happened? The more she craved us. Even after I feel better, even after I'm no longer sick, I still want you as much as I did before. And guess what? I hate to say it, but the more that she hungers for us, the more that we give her. Right? Because how do you pass us up? Even this morning, I got up early. Annie and Rosie were still in bed. I made my coffee, trying to get ready. I knew I had to get into church. I tried to get here early so I could study and get ready for the day. Even this morning, I walk in the bedroom, and Rosie's like this. I'm like, Rosie, I don't have time. She starts to cry. So what did I do? I got ready and got my coffee together, all with her on my hips. Right? The whole time. Why? Because... She's relied on her father's presence. And the more that she relied on that presence, the more that she craved it and she wanted it. And here's the good thing about good fathers. The more we crave their presence, the more of their presence that they give. You serve a good father. Do you believe that this morning? And so the more that you rely on his presence day after day after day, the more that you crave him and you want more of him and you want to be with him and you want him to fill you up. And the good thing about our father, the more that we crave him, the more that he wants to give us. He sees us like this with arms outstretched. God, I want more. How can he pass that up? He wants to fill you all the more. The more that you rely, the more that you crave, the more of God's presence that you give. I want to tell you this morning, God's calling all of us to something today. We all have a calling that God's laid on our hearts. Some new place he's calling us to go. Some new person he's calling us to touch. Some new situation he wants to work through us in. But so quickly, that I am statement is going to get in your way. It happens so quickly. It happens so easily. And so this morning, I want to respond to God's calling this morning with communion. That's how we're going to respond this morning. So if you have your communion with you, I encourage you to take it along with me. Go ahead and unwrap it. There's two wrappers there where you can get the bread out and the cup on the second. Go ahead and unwrap those along with us. Hang on to them. We're going to be partaking of those in just a moment. Our kids are joining us. They're more than welcome to join us. If you feel like they know what communion is and what it's all about, they can join us as well. And I want to mention, too, while our kids are in the service with us, your calling doesn't kick in when you're 18. Right? Even our kids have a calling that God has laid out their lives. He wants to help them to make a difference. The problem is, is that when we get this calling, this I am stands in the way and it blurs our lenses and cloud over our life. It becomes our biggest excuse and our biggest obstacle. I want to remind you this morning, if your I am is that you feel unworthy, if you're here this morning and you say, I am unworthy, I want to tell you, God looks at your sin, God looks at your shame, God looks at your past, but he doesn't see any of that. All he sees 
is this. Paul, he sees as Jesus. Because of what we're about to remember and commemorate and think about and reflect on and celebrate in the act of communion, is that there was a guy who gave his body and his blood for you. To give you victory over whatever you're going through. Because of this, because of Christ's sacrifice, you are made worthy in Christ. You don't have to feel unworthy anymore. <laughs> Maybe your I am this morning is that you're saying, listen, I hear God's call. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I am the wrong person. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're pointing at other people. You're trying to say, God, this is who you really want. This is who you really need to send. Maybe you feel like you are just not the right person. I want to tell you, it's Pentecost Sunday. God's given his spirit to you. He, he wants to be offered that up to you because you might not have what it takes, but you definitely have his spirit. The more you rely on it, the more that you crave it, the more he wants to give you. And so in this moment of communion, I would encourage you, pray for God's spirit. Pray for a fresh outpouring of all that he is as we take this in just a moment. And as we leave here this morning, I want to remind you, God didn't just say, hey, so go whenever things get normal. Go whenever you get things figured out. But instead, God says, so now go. It's always something. Life will never be normal. So you better follow the call of God now. This communion supper was instituted by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a sacrament which, provides, which proclaims his life, his suffering, his sacrificial death and resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. Do you believe Christ is coming again? Amen. Absolutely. It shows forth the Lord's death until his return. This supper is a means of grace, meaning that when we participate in it and we, we partake of it, God's grace is able to work in our hearts and in our lives. We believe that Christ is present by the Spirit this morning. It's to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. If you're here this morning and you're truly repentant, forsaking of your sins, and you believe in Jesus for salvation, you can take this communion and supper this morning. And let me tell you, if you're here this morning and you don't believe in Jesus, what better time to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior than right now in this moment as you eat of his body and drink of his blood and remember how he died for you. We come to the table that we may be renewed in life and in salvation and be made one by the Spirit. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of, sin, forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You'll take the body with me this morning. This body is, or this bread is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for you. May it preserve you blameless into everlasting life. Eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And be thankful. We'll take the bread. And this juice represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. May preserve you, preserve you blameless into everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And be thankful. Drink this for you. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I'm just so thankful that. You are a God who calls your people. Lord, you have a purpose and you have a plan for each and every one of us. Not only a big, overarching life plan, but Lord, I believe that you have a daily plan. You have a weekly plan. You have stuff that you want us to do, ways in which you want us to work, ways in which you want to work through us to touch people that we may not otherwise speak to or, or, or minister to, God. But so often, Lord, we have to admit that things can so easily get in the way. Lord, so easily things can pop up and our I ends can become our biggest excuses and our biggest obstacles. You know, Father, I just pray that if there's anybody here who feels like they are unworthy, that they will feel your presence surround them and your love surround them. They will feel like they've been made worthy because of Christ Jesus. And Lord, if there's anybody here who feels like they're not the right person for whatever you're calling them to do, God, I pray that they will accept a heavy dose of your spirit today, a complete infilling, an overflowing of your spirit. That, Lord, there's not one day that they won't crave all that your spirit has to offer. That they can't even leave their house unless they, Lord, leave with you along with them. 
Because we believe, Lord, the more that we crave your spirit, the more you want to offer it to us. Would you go with your spirit, with your church today, Lord? Would you fill us with your spirit? And finally, God, would you help us to stop sitting on our hands? Lord, if we hear your voice and you say, so now go, my prayer, God, is that we'll not say I'm not ready. But instead, Lord, we will go right now and fulfill the calling that you called upon our lives. Lord, I'm so thankful for all that you've done for us. I'm thankful that you fill your spirit, your, your church with your spirit, God. With that same spirit that we're filled with, go with us, Lord, as we leave. And enable us for the service to which you've called us. God, we love you and we thank you. We ask all of this in your name and all God's people said. Amen.